while I'm getting situated, if you want to grab your Bibles and turn to Revelations chapter 2. Those were spot on worship songs tonight. Uh, maybe I'm the only one. I don't know. That hit the spot for me. But uh, so last week we had prayer night, uh, but week before that, we covered Ephesus and Sardis. And if you guys remember that, we're here for that. Uh, we were talking about a religious spirit or legalistic spirit and a um, liberal spirit. This week, we'll be looking at Pergamum and Thyatira. And as we get into these, we'll see two different spirits at work in these churches. But I just want to ask a question real quick. Has anyone ever met a really, really good car salesman or salesman of for anything that before you know it, you've done bought two or three things from him? Usually what they're selling, they overhype it. And you don't get what you pay for. And they make it sound way better than what it actually is. And that's what we'll see in these churches, because both of these churches suffered from false teachers and false prophets. So they were selling something that wasn't from the Lord. So it was way overhyped. They made it sound better than what it was. Well, let's, let's get into the text. So in Revelations chapter 2, verses 12 through 17 is where we see Pergamum. And it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give him some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. And we also see in Revelations 2, 18 through 29, Thyatira. So we'll go ahead and read that as well. It says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith, and service and patience, endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality, and eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay any other burden, do not, do not lay on you any other burden. 
Hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and the one who keeps my work until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. As when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's a lot here to unpack. And reading through this, you can see some similarities. Both churches suffered from their members practicing sexual immorality, worshiping idols, all that good stuff. But there were some good things. There were some good things. So we'll look at those first. So in Pergamum, we see that in chapter 2, verse 13. It says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. I would like for Jesus to say that about me, that I held fast his name, that I didn't turn away from him. Even Antipas here says he was a faithful witness. He, he was even killed for his belief. Are we at a point in our lives where we would give our life up for our faith? In 1 John 3.16, it says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Jesus loved us so much that he gave his life for us. Even the worst people that we can think of in this world, Jesus loved them so much that he died for them. John says, we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. So are we at a point in our life, in our faith, in our walk with God, that we would lay down our lives for someone else? In Thyatira, in Revelations 2, 19, it says, I know your works, you love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. That's a pretty good pat on the back there, too. You're growing. Your first works were small, but you're getting bigger. You're getting better. You're doing more and all this. That's great. They were continuing to grow in their love and faith and service, patience, all of that. But we need to look at that and ask ourselves, are we still growing? Or are we stuck where, we're, where we've been for however long? What do we need to surrender so that we can keep growing? In Hebrews 5, verses 13 and 14, it says, For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So the more we walk with God, the more we will, the more discernment we will gain. And we will move from milk to solid food. So we will mature. Are we still growing? Or are we still where we were when we started our walk? And then we get into the rebukes. So for Pergamum, we see that in Revelations 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So, when we first started this series, we covered this more in depth. And we went back to Numbers and we looked at 
everything that Balaam did. Uh, we saw that there was greed involved, idolatry, and sexual immorality were the biggest ones in play there. You also see uh, that in these churches as well, the sexual immorality and the and the idolatry part. For Thyatira, and this is of all the churches, Thyatira has the longest rebuke. But in Revelations 2, 20 through 23, it says, But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. So here, Jesus actually uses a name, Jezebel. This isn't the same person, Jezebel, as in First Kings, but it is the same spirit working behind this woman as the woman in First Kings. Because if you go back and you read the story of Jezebel in First Kings, there was idolatry, there was sexual immorality, she was murderous, she practiced witchcraft, she lied, all sorts of very evil, nasty things. Something else you see in these churches that it doesn't specifically call out is an Ahab spirit. And if you're familiar with this story from First Kings about Ahab and Jezebel, Ahab was very cowardly. He had no backbone. He was very pleasure-minded. He was easily controlled, and he allowed Jezebel to do whatever she wanted to do. And he did not run his family as the head of the family, as God intends. And I do like the actual King James Version of verse 20, because in the ESV it says that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, but King James says that you suffer that woman Jezebel. And if you've ever had to deal with someone who is being controlled by that spirit, you will suffer. You will suffer. And you can see that when you read the story of Elijah. Anytime he dealt with Ahab, he was able basically to make Ahab cower down. But Jezebel was a different story. It was a head-on collision every time that those two ever associated with each other. So, now we kind of look at this from a slightly different angle here. In 1 Corinthians 5, 11 through 13, it says, But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality, greed, or is an idolater, reveler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So we, we see in Thyatira, where Jesus said that you tolerate or you suffer this woman Jezebel. And the folks at the church in Thyatira, the folks at the church in Pergamum, they let those false teachers come in. They just let them go. They didn't challenge them. They didn't do anything. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if someone calls themselves a brother, we're supposed to hold them to the standard that is the Bible. The first step in that, though, 
is what we've been saying all along, is we have to use the Bible as a mirror so that we make sure we're right first and that we're not trying to correct something that we're guilty of too. And in Jude verse 4, it says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Back then, before John wrote Revelations, Jude wrote his book. It was happening before. It was happening in John's time. It's still happening today. Any time God is building a church, moving in a church, building our homes, moving in our homes and in our family, the enemy is going to send opposition. First John 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. We have to test. We have to test the spirits. There's no way around it. We are all part of the responsibility of testing the spirits. It's not just the leadership in our homes. It's not just the leadership in the church. Everyone has that responsibility. So the resolution, how can they fix it? How can they get back on the right path? So for Pergamum, we see that in Revelations 2, verse 16. It says, therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Repent. Simple. Admit you're wrong, say you're sorry, and change your ways. Thyatira, it's kind of split for Thyatira, so we see that in verses 24 and 25, and then the last half of verse 22. So 24 and 25, it says, But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some things call the deep things of Satan. To you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Hold fast to what you have until I come. The second half of verse 22 says, unless they repent of her works. Again, repentance. And if you remember from Ephesus and Sardis, it was the same thing. Repent. Repentance. There's no way you can escape the judgment or the consequences without repentance. And both churches had com commendations and both had rebukes. So there's good and bad people at the church. And by that, I mean there's... by good, I mean those that are following Jesus and those that are not following Jesus. The language that Jesus uses, if you notice, it's much more harsh to these two churches than it was to Ephesus and Sardis. But the reason he uses this language is because he wanted everyone to know how serious he is at stopping these two particular spirits, because these two spirits feed off of each other. And if they left unchecked, they get worse with every generation. And we see that in the story of Ahab and Jezebel and their kids. So if you go back to First and Second Kings and read that, in Second Kings 11, you will see a woman named Athaliah. Athaliah was Jezebel's daughter. She married a king, Jehoram, over Judah. When their son died, she went absolutely crazy, killed all the royal family who had a claim to the throne so that she could be the ruler. 
and she was the only female ruler of Judah who ruled without a king. She was way, way worse than her mother. Ahab's sons, 2 Kings 10, it says that they were very afraid of a gentleman named Jehu. And after reading Jehu's story, I don't blame them. But they were so afraid, none of them would step up and take the throne, even though they were next in line, according to the line of succession. They wouldn't even talk to Jehu. They would not come to meet him. They sent word through the city elders and city leaders to Jehu. At least Ahab would meet with Elijah. He, he would end up cowering down to Elijah, but at least he would meet him face to face. His sons were way more cowardly. They wouldn't even meet with Jehu, wouldn't talk to him. So, what are the rewards for those who overcome? What, what can they expect? For Pergamum, we see that in Revelations 2. Verse 17, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give him some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone so that no one, that no one knows except the one who received it. And for Thyatira, we see that in Revelations 2, verses 26 and 28, it says, The one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. Again, Rewards that we will not see here on this earth, but we will see after the judgment, after everything is said and done, and rewards that just sound awesome. I don't know any other way to say it. It just sounds awesome. But we see, we can kind of see from these two churches what happens when an Ahab and Jezebel spirit move in. It would happen with our in our homes as well if we let it happen there. So, a few signs of the Jezebel spirit. And Jezebel was a woman. She did live. She was married to Ahab. The spirit does typically work in women, but that spirit can also affect men. And it's the same with the Ahab spirit. It typically affects men, but it can affect women as well. So a few signs of the Jezebel spirit. She uses control, manipulation, and domination. Some might would say that that's forms of witchcraft. She uses fear, flight, and discouragement, or emotional manipulation going back to the witchcraft. And we, we could probably discuss what is and isn't witchcraft, whether these fall under that realm or not. In 2 Kings 9.22, it says, When Joram saw Jehu, so Joram is Ahab's son. He was the last of his sons to actually be brave enough to sit on the throne. He said, is it peace, Jehu? He answered, so Jehu answered, what peace can there be so long as the whorings and the sorceries of your mother Jezebel are so many? So whether these first few fall under witchcraft or not, it's safe to say that she practiced witchcraft. And she could use that to manipulate other people and to spiritually oppress other people. 
but she also seduces and provokes sexual immorality. She teaches false doctrine. She loves leadership positions. She thrives where leadership is weak, and she is not repentant. Few signs of the Ahab spirit. They fear speaking the truth. They fear confrontation. They expect someone else to take care of them. And we see that again in 1 Kings. When Naboth wouldn't sell Ahab his vineyard, he came back to the palace, curled up on his bed and started crying and pitching a fit. And Jezebel had to step in. But what she did was horrible. But he couldn't handle it himself. He had her handle it. He secretly suffers from anxiety and chronic fear. He is not a provider or protector, and he doesn't know that identity that God has given a man. He's very compromising. He lacks leadership skills and the anointing of a leader, but has the position and title of a leader. And unfortunately, corporate America nowadays loves Ahabs in management positions. Don't say nothing. Don't rock the boat. Compromise with everybody and we'll promote you up the chain. So the last note that I have, if you would like to turn to Matthew chapter 7, we will look at verses 15 through 20. So here Jesus is talking to us. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. So just as Paul was talking in 1 Corinthians, Jesus is saying the same thing here in a slightly different way. If we get to know our church family, if we get to know everybody, we will see what kind of fruits their lives produce. And then we will know who they serve. We will know all of that by their fruits. And then we take what Paul had said in 1 Corinthians. Once you know their fruits, once you see that they're practicing all these horrible, evil things, and they're not repenting, they're not trying to change, don't have anything to do with them. Don't associate with them. Don't eat with them. Just leave them alone. Let God deal with them. But we can't do any of that if our hearts aren't in the right place. That's been one of the biggest things along with spiritual warfare, is to use God's word as a mirror. If we have any of these signs of these two spirits, we need to make sure we're repentant of that before we can help others. And a note that I didn't make with Ephesus and Sardis, these signs are kind of like side effects on pharmaceuticals 
just because they're listed doesn't mean you'll see every single one of them exhibited every single time. Somebody may be controlled by one of these spirits, but you only see one sign. Kind of like some of the pharmaceuticals, some people don't have any side effects. Some people have one or two. Some people draw the really short straw and have them all. Just because there's multiple signs doesn't mean you will see all of them, whether it's the Jezebel or Ahab spirits or the religious, legalistic spirits or the liberal spirits. But you will recognize their fruit because no matter how many signs they have, their fruit cannot be hidden. You will see their fruit. And we will know it from that. And we have to make sure we're right before we can help others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yes, they want to be the one on top so that they don't have to answer to anybody. You're exactly right. And with that, I will close this in prayer unless anyone has any other comments or questions. or Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening and we want to thank you again, Lord, for this day and for giving us the ability to gather here in your name. And we thank you, Lord, for being here with us as we study your word. And we thank you for opening all of our hearts and minds to what you had to say to us tonight. And Lord, I just ask that you be with everybody here as they finish their weeks and just watch over them and protect them as they go through their days. Help everyone here to have everything that they need to get through their days. Peace, the comfort, the strength, your love and your grace and your mercy. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.